so we did one pull request binding in content type editor which is which is yeah this was kind of this was useful for uh, this is a technical value so we don't care it's generated automatically it's a prefix but now it's using the name instead of the index and I think there was a reason which is that at some point you wanted to reuse this value in some template or something like this so that's it I'll show two I'll show two fetch all So seven days without the rebase. This is Nick working on JSON API slash GraphQL. Um, this is a branch. Oh, this is, uh, it should have been branch, so I should have deleted that. Um, so it must have been branch later. So we don't care about this one. Um, yeah, fixing a scope lifetime. Fixing a scope lifetime. This is just fixing a build error. And then I make a change here. Nothing important. So build error. Uh, two things that will be merged later so we should see it appear in the feed fix notifications yes so fix notification were not working anymore because since the change we made that creating a shape is async we need to await things this is another branch that must have been merged so it will appear later and then update VS code settings so yeah, updating the VS Code properties so you can use VS Code directly. Issue challenge result for admin pages. The idea being that um, if we return unauthorized result, then we get a blank page with a 401. But by, so this is an admin filter. If you put an authorized, uh, yeah, if you put an authorized attribute on a controller, it will redirect you to the login. But if you'd go somewhere and the admin filter would have blocked you because you're trying to access an admin page and you're not authenticated, it was just returning a 401 and you get a blank page with a 401. So now we are returning a challenge result so that um, we can redirect to the login page instead. Um, this is a branch, this is a branch, branch, branch. Creating content part alternates automatically. So the idea is that um, whenever you return a shape, let's say like there. Is that a good example? Is that a good example? Yes, a back bar display, you call the display method and you call return shape, which will create a shape result, an eye display result, uh, with this shape type and initialize the properties and you want to put the shape at this location and so on. So it's a shape result. So now this change means that um, whenever you call shape like this, we will be able also to alter the shape result automatically from a driver because now we call the correct um, method of our rides and this way in this class where is it content no not this one uh, content part display driver so the base content part display driver what it will do is because we call the correct shape result we will be able to add some alternates on every shape you return for a content part and these alternates will be like part type, content type and part name because the name of the part can be different than the part itself um, so we add alternates automatically examples and it's documented here I will show you the documentation which will be better uh, the documentation is, is, is in templates readme 
documentation. I explain how it works, uh, shapes and alternates and everything. And then, yeah, now you have content underscore underscore content type. The template is called when displaying a content item with a detail display type. For instance, when access, blah, blah. Examples, template file name. So I give the template name, content underscore underscore blog post, and the file name, the corresponding file name. Okay? And two examples, because they're different. This is what you will type in a template module, and this is what you type from a file. It's also interesting to know which type of shape it is, because we can it can be useful somewhere else than just the design, the template editor in the admin. Um, so that's it, and available properties if you want to theme the things, like content item is the item you're currently rendering, content is a zone shape, so you can display it, and this is a content. So if you want to reuse all the shapes that are available for this content item rendering, then this is content. If you just want to use the content itself, just use content item. Um, this is important because we have now um, ways to access what is inside a content zone or any zone um, of a shape because because we have like now you can do um, dot and uh, a name like dot body part or dot whatever you want um, and you can then remove them exclude them from this zone so you can say yeah so you don't have to create a placement to exclude something if you want or to reuse something um, so display type content type and you see underscore display type underscore underscore content type so that the file is content dash blog post dot summary but the actual shape type here is underscore summary here okay um, that's it and same thing for the parts but I will remove uh, some things from the parts so these parts are right content part underscore so content type so you can do list part blog so the list part for blog post for blog type the body part for blog post the body part for an article actually by default the blog post they have a markdown part so that's kind of bad but yeah that, that gives you the idea uh, the properties are wrong this is what I discovered uh, with some feedback uh, these are wrong so we'll need to work on that I will remove that and just show what's available these are wrong because it is specific to each part, actually. Yes? Uh, yeah, a question on this stuff, Sebastian. Are the rules for how we translate a shape name into the different paths and file names on disk that the template might reside, are those the same in Orchard Core as they were in Orchard? Yes. OK, good. <clears throat> then uh, I was looking through the examples in the, in the readme file here, and I don't see an example of uh, of a, having a path, like part of the name, a folder. You know how you can do oh, that? Yes. Hyphen URL. No, no, I mean, um, like, I think the under, underscore can be translated yes. either to like a folder slash or... But not, not directly, it's just parts. The parts oh. folder. Oh, oh okay, and one. fields, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's just specific ones. Okay, I thought I'm not was, even sure. Yeah. No, yeah, it, maybe it was generic in Orchard One, and I don't think we have it in Orchard Core anymore. We it wasn't do... generic in Orchard One. Uh, it only had support for parts and fields, and you had to customize some piece of core code uh, to extend it. I had to do it for the elements for the layouts functionality. Yeah, and I I don't think we have that anymore in Orchard Core. We we look into specific folders like items and views and shapes something but we don't extend the folder and yeah we don't do that anymore no but that's the same in orchard one yeah but orchard one there is already support for fields and parts and as you say for elements and anything but we don't even have fields and parts folder name supports oh, i see we will we will be looking in some specific folders but we don't but not those don't extract the name of the folder from the from the shape name. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Got it. Um, and I'm actually—I was actually before joining the meeting. This why I was late for for one minute. I'm actually working still on this feature, on the namings and the things about shape types and different shaders and prefixes and everything to make sense of everything, and so that they don't suck, they don't they they look nice and they they make sense, like they don't look like a bunch of things. So there is some logic I will show you probably will show you. 
So yeah, this thing is was to add alternates automatically uh, for parts. And this morning I was also working on fields actually because I forgot to do that. Let's do the same thing on fields because we need to be able to change the templates for specific fields. Um, but I made that principally because um, because when we have named parts like a back part, you know, from the content, the landing page in the agency, it has lots of back parts, name back parts, and we need to be able to change um, their templates in very. So now you can say back part, well, let's not look at this one very, because there is summary, so back part dash landing page dash services. So in the type landing page, so back part in the type landing page for the one named services, for the one named portfolios because you can also say all the body part let me show you this one all the body above all the body part in a blog post okay or all the body part in an article this case here is all the back part in a landing page but just no the one that is called services because you might have multiple back part in the same type you can still replace all the back parts if you want all the back parts for a landing page but it's better to say Joe just the one which are services but maybe you have a back for the same page, you have multiple back parts which actually represent the same content type. So you want the same template and you don't want to distinguish between which names are used. Uh, yeah, but that, that's more flexibility. That's all you, you need to be able to do. Um, yep, and same thing with the display type, okay? So because, for instance, when we display a back part by default like services, all these things are displayed as summary in the landing page because we list all the items of a back part and we display them as a summary. You, uh, also this pull request added a, proper, uh, pro, um, a setting for the back part so you can decide what is the display type for an item in a back part for each back. So by default it's summary but you can define which display type you want. Um, Thank you, Antoine. Yes, you can access directly the same thing online. It looks even better. And we can see some discrepancy. No, this is the properties. I don't like this style, um, Antoine, just telling you because I, I saw that before in other pages, too small compared to everything else. Should be bigger. These uh, code blocks here. Code blocks are too small. They are like 0. Point something em, and they shouldn't be the same as these things. And why is this one bold? Yeah, why is this bold? Be be oh. Because you have a double underscores. Okay, so yeah, maybe we need to backtick them. Maybe it will remove that. I'm not even sure. Okay. Yep, so that's good. We need to fix some things. Um, yeah, also widgets, how to configure, a, customize a widget. As a reminder, Sipka widget is used for anything that is a block, like elements, widget. This is the same thing. It's called a widget now. So you don't have to do many things. And a widget is a content type, so it's the same driver. It's just a different stereotype. It's pretty fun. Um, I was on Git. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was a, a big change, but not breaking anything, just fixing stuff. Uh, invoking iModular tenant events, terminating. This was because, because we have users who do things already on Orchard Core. So in this case, what were they doing? Uh, let me think. Um, maybe it was related to the caching. What was it about caching? They were caching stuff. Ah, oh, can't remember. Who, who's using it? I don't know what's the company, but they were doing some. So the, I don't know. So let me look at the issue first. So the issue was. That, oh yeah, I know. So they were storing stuff pertinent for caching but whenever they will restart the tenant the oh yeah I, I okay everything is clear now <laughs> sorry um going backwards 
So they are, using, they are using the users module and they're authenticating users. And the authentication is using cookies by default. So the permissions are in the cookies. Um, but when they will restart um, a tenant, they will lose the authentication. And all right, it's not possible because you don't lose a cookie when you restart a tenant and the cookie contains an authentication. Actually, what they were doing is they were setting a property of the, um, of the cookie authentication middleware, which is token store, which lets you define where you want to store the actual cookie content on the server side. And they were doing it in memory. And you do that only if your cookies are too big and you want just to have a grid in the cookie and have all the content of the cookie on the server side. It's like kind of a session, but just for cookie content. And they were doing that because they had many, many things to their cookies for the authentication authentication reasons. And, um, and because they were using a memory cache on dev, every time they will reset the feature, then they will lose all the, the cookie information and they will be disconnected. So they wanted a way to, well, when we found there that it was on their issue, then we found another thing because they wanted to, a way to be able to serialize uh, these cached entities when the tenant is about to be restarted and reuse it across tenant restarts. But actually we found out that uh, we were correctly invoking the, the, the event called activating on the tenants whenever we were starting a tenant, but we are not correctly calling terminating when the tenant was being terminated. So this pull request is about, well, this change is about uh, calling, you see, um, calling, calling, so resolving iModular tenant events and calling terminating async when, and terminated async uh, when the tenant is about to be disposed and then dispose the tenant. That's the idea. Now they can, if they want, use this token store because it's provided and store the token store wherever they want before and after uh, the tenant is restarted. Uh, that's it. And for your information, because you care about it, uh, so here in this case, so the shell context here, this is new to in Orchard Core, this is not in Orchard One. What we do is whenever a shell context um, is used, which is just a list of services from a tenant, then uh, we count the the number of uh, requests that are using that, that are running on the server for this current tenant. Okay, and we do that by uh, by 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 request ended and request started, which is called from the um, default host, and we just do interlock decrement and increment the number of requests which are going on. Okay, and this isn't from a middleware in a try catch, so we are always doing that. Uh, we do that so that when we dispose a tenant, we will only dispose the shell context once the last request on this tenant um, has been done. Otherwise, you will have requests which will use dispose services and that will fail. So it doesn't handle all the cases, uh, possible cases that could go wrong, but at least it solves the most obvious ones. Um, so just for your information, something you might not have seen when it was done a month ago. That's it. Then, so this is a PR, this is another PR, and this is an update on README. So this is the PR that uh, Chantier is working on. Build display, it's a new um, liquid tag that we need because, so let me show you. Um, is there a difference here? Yeah, I, I asked him to, oh yeah, it's, the issue is when it starts a PR, now, now it forks too many things. So first it's about adding a build display. Where is that? It's not even documented, so sad. Um, a build display liquid tag that lets you build the display for a content item. Okay. Typically you have a back part full of things of content items and you want to just use the rendering of this content item using the drivers. So you can now call build display a content item and a property and the display type optional and then you get a shape okay, as usual to render this thing. Because we have a tag already that's called display. So now you can do display and then uh, build display of something. Okay, so you can do that. And at the same time, he added more 
um, tags that are useful for theming, adding alternates, removing the classes, and adding classes okay, to a shape. Okay, stuff you can do by code in Razor, but in Liquid you need custom filters. And they are documented, so that's nice. Um, so that's the build display. And I think that's all. Then Nick working on JSON API, making good progress. If you have something to show, I think you can. I'm working on, so this is the same work as before. I'm working on um, the differentiator and the prefix. I had, I had created in the, in the PR, I showed you a, a name property for the shape metadata, but it's actually unnecessary because we already have something called differentiator, which is actually that. So just to restate the, the properties we have on the shape metadata, we have a oh, shape metadata. I will just open shape metadata. So when we create a shape, we have shape metadata. It has a prefix property. This one is used only for rendering HTML forms um, so that if the same, for instance, field or part is used many times during in an editor or even display, then they have different um, prefixes. Okay, like different, they will have different names, like a text box, text field. It's used in different parts. It's used maybe in different fields in the same content type. So the prefix will define something which is unique per content type and per part. So ideally, it will it will be type and part. Okay, that's it. And then the because it's just a prefix, then each field will have its own value. Um, each form field will have its own value. And then we have differentiator, which is not available here. It was not available, but actually uh, it's called name in the metadata. Now it's very recent. Um, we could call it differentiator, but I just want to call it name. Uh, this is something which is unique uh, in the, which is unique in the containers zone. Example, I am, and I might have to change that. Uh, so, for instance, differentiator, when you create a text field, the differentiator will be the name of the field. When you create a name part, the differentiator will be the name of the part um, because it's unique. So, in a part, you only have one. So, in, in a specific part, you can have fields, and every field is unique name. Okay, so in this case, the names will be unique per the part. A part can have a name. And these names are unique per content type. So the name of a part shape will be unique for the content type. Okay. So you could have the same name in the same page multiple times, but it's not used to um, render some HTML which is global to the page. It's used in the context of the owner. Okay. So that's the differentiator. And this way, uh, the differentiator was used previously for placement, but here we need to use it for being able to filter a shape inside a zone. For instance, this is what I had done um, um, with the name thing. So um, let me show you an example why we need that. It helps a lot templating and you will find out if you know what placement is. And so let's look at this one, for instance. How come we've got processing async and not displaying and displayed async? I already answered that last time, Nick. I don't want to answer it every time. You need to look at the documentation. Oh, damn <laughs> oh, it. Okay. I swear you asked exactly the same question last time. But I, uh, let me try to remember the answer. OK, OK. Um, I think this is because the ones who are, don't have the name, they are all async. But processing, I think there's a processing and a processing async. I think there are the two of them because we support uh, action or funk. Yes, maybe that's it. Because we support the, the two over rows or something like that. There is one which is missing and which is, which is not missing. I think that's the reason. OK, or, I will or, never ask again. Or I will watch the video again last time when I did the change. Because I think you commented on the PR. Then you asked the, did. Then you asked the question at the last meeting where I explained the, the, the thing. But that's OK. Uh, OK. It happens to me every day. But I ask, <laughs> I ask the question about my code. Why did I write that? And I have to look at the code to understand why I did Ah, oh, oh, it makes sense now. And then I had a comment for the next time I ask myself the question. 
<laughs> okay, but yeah, there was a reason and you were fine with that. So I will Okay, fine. cool. So this template, content block, so it's to change the block template for uh, the block type, okay, the block type. So the blog has a list of parts, title, body, uh, some other things, list part and things like that, okay? When we want to, to customize the rendering, uh, here we explicitly use the title property, okay, of the content item. And here we explicitly use the body part uh, shape of the content item. The idea is that, okay, we can use it, sometimes we want to use the content itself, and sometimes we want to delegate the rendering of a part to its drivers, because it does too much things that we don't want to do in, in the template, like e evaluating markdown, or because the default driver shape template is fine, and we just want to reuse that. So we want to mix um, between data and shape rendering. So in this case, this is what we do. We, in the header zone of the theme, we render this specific HTML. We contain the title and contains the body part rendering. Okay, we just say display model.content. This is the shape, the zone shape, okay, of the um, of the model, which is the main shape of the content. This is content shape. The content property is the zone shape containing all the parts of this content item. And the body part is the name, is the name of a shape, not a shape type, the name of a shape, as in shape metadata dot name. Okay. Um, so name shape, so that we can point to it and remove it if we want, or just display it from individually. So in this case, we render individually the body part. We don't take the list part or the title part or anything. We just take, oh, give me whatever is named body part shape um, for, the, for the current content item I'm running. And then after that, because we already rendered the body part in the header zone, and we might want to render everything else like the title part and everything else um, after in, in the content zone, then we do display model dot content, which is all the shapes, but we already rendered body part. And in this case, we don't want to render it there. So we just say remove item body part. So the result of that is all the shapes without the body part shape. So if tomorrow we decide to add a new part to the block type, this guy will render it okay, correctly. In Orchard 1, we will have had to, you know, we do some custom placement files in, how do how is it called, ghost, ghost zone or something like that? You made an article, Bertrand, about it. So we create a custom zone, we put, we might remove everything in placement into this zone, and we call the custom zone. This is how you will do that in Orchard 1, and this is much easier to do it this way. You just say, display this name part, or don't display this name part, but everything else. Okay, so that's uh, that's a way to do that, uh, and that's why we need named because the remove item or the property doing something like this, they use the the they used to use the shape type which works with body part, but in the case of bags bag parts which can which are named part, you can't use dot bag part because you want to use dot services or dot uh, team, okay? So we need to give it a name, a different thing, but by default the name if is the name of the part. So for body part, it works. And for back part, it will be dot services. Okay, that's, that's how you can pick specific parts, specific shapes uh, from, a con from a zone, like the content zone. Okay, and we'll be able to do the same thing with, um, with fields because they will have a name which will be like, let's say uh, content uh, blog part um, dash uh, custom field. We will be able also to move field shapes around and or just not render them uh, if we don't want them in specific templates without having to use placement. Placement will still work because we can mark this specific shape as not displayed with a dash or nothing, but we can also do that from the template if we need to. That's, that's good. That's the idea with uh, the dot name property. And in Razor, um, in Razor, so there is dot named, uh, 
So yes, you can access it with the same thing with the just accessing the property like model dot content dot name and you access it like this, like this like this. So you will just do add display async and the part. In liquid you need to call display and you need to do remove item. Uh, and there is a dot remove I think. Uh, I uh, maybe yeah. It's documented. That's the that's the idea of the of this PR of this change. Did I miss some questions? Okay, he's doing his demo on the chat. Uh, create, get, delete content. You don't want to show? Uh, I haven't got a compiling solution. Um, I forgot. I didn't realize about the time difference, so I don't. I don't have a compiler. I didn't have so, time to get anything ready. Create, get, delete content items. Okay. Yep. Create so this you know we don't care. Get using nested. <laughs> no, let's yeah. Talk. So the get nested parts thing is kind of cool because that's um, that allows you to write queries like uh, blog and then under and then inside that you can do yeah. uh, title part colon. Um, I mean, I can write. So I can show quickly what I mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's quite cool about um, what, mean? Uh, what is it? What have I been working on? GraphQL um, is that uh, you can, like I said last time I demoed, is that you can ask for stuff and you will get stuff back. Um, but you get back only the stuff that you ask for. Uh, now, I added in a feature that allows you to query based on nested Zoom in. Uh, content, uh, based on content parts. So let's say that you've got a blog. Am I muted? No, I can hear you. Please zoom in. Right. Zoom in. Okay, hang on. Thank Better? You. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you've got a um, a blog. Uh, so let's say you've got a content um, content item. So a blog is a content item. And a blog is made up of a title part. Title part has got a property on there of title, and then you've also got auto route part, which has got, I believe, path on there. Um, we're just going to go with those those um, two to start with. Um, just but just when you say that, I'm I already want to use Orchard. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next thing is cool. So that's great. Uh, so I've got I've got some content items. I can't remember the syntax to create a content item, but what we can do is we can query. So um, one of the things that uh, we spoke about last time is that also on a blog we've got um, content item ID. Uh, we don't use the ID per se because that's relative relative uh, relative to the database. So um, I'm going to write a quick query, and the query will look like this. So I want to get a content item back. Um, and the content item I want to get back in this instance has a content item ID. Of, I'm just going to make one up of foobar. Um, cool. And I want to say, cool, so I want, I'm going to get a content item ID back. Um, if you just do that... You have the this will return back nothing. Nothing. Okay, that's good. This will return back nothing. Um, we return you a uh, two hundred something saying, "Yeah, I found it," but absolutely. no content. But no content. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and if this doesn't exist, it'll actually return you a four hundred four. Um, will it return you a four hundred four? I hope so. No, it will return you an empty item. Actually, yeah. Oh, that's bad. Uh, because yeah, you don't really four hundred four in GraphQL land. I see. Um, I see. Makes sense. Okay. So the problem with content querying like this, you can only ever get the items that are, are on content item, because at this point in time, you don't really know what you are. Um, so I could I could return the ID, for example, and I could return content content type, um, and that would be great. That would give me back my content type and my content ID, but it wouldn't. 
it wouldn't be able to distinguish what a title part or an auto route part is. So the next thing we decided to do is we took that to the next level. So I know that I've got a blog. Cool. So I want to query based on my blog. And I know that I've got a content and my blog has got a content item ID of FUBAR. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and I can, again, I can get, uh, I can get the ID and I can get the content type back because a blog is a content item. The only difference between this and this query is that as a blog, I know what I am. Which is good, which is interesting. That means that I can start doing interesting things like I can start saying I want to get my title part back where I have got my title. So I, I now have the title part, the title of the title part coming back within my blog. If I but, use if I use a GraphQL dedicated client like an editor. Will it get? This would be valid. This would be completely valid. Um, and completely it will, yes, valid. and it will have metadata, so I will have auto completion and everything. Yeah. So um, if you make a query for the schema, the schema will be returned, and you Perfect. will be, would and be that's able why to. You uh, want to specify blog because this way you explain what type you get, and you can have exactly. So this is kind of like the schema here. You can see. That's you great. can see the schema as I scroll down. So you've got a blog, and you've got all this interesting and stuff. And this you generate dynamically. This is all generated dynamically on the That's fly. Cool. That's great. You can see that it's got loads and loads of stuff. There's queries and mutations and et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, so this is interesting. So I've got a blog and I've got my ID and I've got my content type and I've got my content title part. Notice that there's no some commas at the end. This isn't JSON we're dealing with. This is GraphQL, though the syntax is very similar. So, hmm, so what I want to do now is I want to say, well, I actually want to query for a blog where I have a title of hi there. And I can do that now because I know what I am. I say that I am a blog where I have a title part with a title of hi there. And I can return again. I can get my ID if I want that back. And I want to just return my auto route part with the path on. And that's completely valid. And that will work. And again, if I wanted to do a little bit more, then I could also say that. And I want. But what's important here to note is that we can do that, filter on the title of a title part, because you wrote some code specifically for the title of a title part to be able to query like this. Is you yes. can't pass anything from magically from any property. You decided to allow this title property to be queryable, and you have a custom query running looking explicitly for a title index in a database. No, that's bad. So that is a problem. Um, at the moment, it it resolves via um, resolves via properties. It does not use the title index at the moment. Um, and that's the, why I think it should be explicitly exposed by every module that they can extend all the filters for a content item yeah. by providing. Yeah, like... absolutely. Okay. Um, however, right now, that's not the case. Um, and the reason why it's not the case is that uh, is that it's just not the case. Um, uh, it, the way I've written it caters for all the parts, but it doesn't cater for it doesn't cater for a particular index. It only caters for the content item index at the moment. Um, yeah, but content step item after index. search will cater for the will cater, will start catering for indexes. When but right now it doesn't. Content item index title part is not in the content item index. No, I know. So this is resolved afterwards, which makes it slow. Well, fast if you've got not hardly any content. Yeah, but you don't want to do that because then then it will be slow at some point and people will complain. And yep. I prefer yeah, not. Absolutely. 
Um, so I think I'm. But it's doable. Ayush is doable. Ayush is doable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the next part the... is to say, well, the next part. So the way I want it to look is, if I'm querying based on a part, on a title part, then it should fire off and say, do I have any indexes for this particular part? No, I don't think it should be this way. It should be the opposite way, because you know you have an index for the title part title, you will enhance the schema by saying, hey, you can query me by title part title. And when you do that, call this query. What, a named query inside of here? That's a named query. It's mean it's just a blog and title part title. You don't have to use uh, the object notation. And when, so you just enrich the, the schema for querying by adding a new potential query with a title part value. But what right. if I want to do this? Auto route. It will be hard, to, but then it will be there will be one for auto route. I'm um, you can't because that at the moment will work. Auto route part okay because yeah. What do you mean about uh, the moment? I just want that will work. So right what now. my solution will just allow you to just use auto route part. So my solution yeah, currently allows you to do both. Yeah, but you don't. It's right. even worse than the first one because here you are accessing. Uh, I mean, it's the same issue. It's it's too it's too in memory. It's you have to load all the blog and then filter in memory. No, you can't do that. That's why. Well, I'm so, at the moment, but I don't need. If I, going forward, I won't need to load the whole blog because I know that I'm querying on a title part, so I can say, hey. I've got a title part, so use the title part index and use the auto route part index. Okay, if you can do that, but I thought yeah. that in GraphQL you had to explicitly, well, every query type like this with the parents and the parameters inside have to be predefined, all the combinations and everything. Yeah, I, I've done that. I've done that automatically for us. All the combinations? I've done all the combinations that, uh, that I know of that um, yeah, That's scary. it's all built up on the fly. All the parts are attached to the blog on the fly and the blog is generated on the fly. So if I create a new content type, that will be in the schema automatically. I'm talking about the, the filtering part of the query, not the result part, the filtering this, part, this part, yes. yes. Part yes. in the title. Yes. Yeah, that's all That's all done. Um, well, that's, that's all done from in-memory data. My question is, will it be possible to do it dynamically based on index definitions i don't Not think so yet i don't think I so that's why i'm saying we should we will only be able to filter based on pro on filter providers that anyone can write like the title module the title part module will be able to provide a filter provider that says if someone asks for a title part property then go and do this sql query but you won't be able to mix and match title and auto route and stuff and stuff. That's what, how GraphQL works. Can you can you query two indexes at the same time? Yes, but but my concern is that GraphQL, to be able to support that, it will have to know that the combination of the two is available, and then you have um, n dimensions. But you know, you know that you've got these right when you're making the query. That's what I'm saying. You, you, you well, when you're making a query, yeah, but you will you will have your code will have, before you can make the query, to tell GraphQL, hey, here are my 50 parts, and here are all the combinations of parts you can query, like title alone, title plus autoroute, title plus autoroute plus uh, list, title plus list, autoroute plus, list, zero, all the combinations. And that's and then that's just ends, that's not even ors. That's what I'm saying. You won't do that. You would just say by title, by auto route, by alias, by stuff. And then for the complex things, this is your next step, which is use custom queries because a custom query will have a custom set of inputs and this can be expressed in GraphQL very easily. A query equals a set of input equals a GraphQL filter. It can be and and or the query will define what's the logic. If you pass a title and an route and end and or one or the other, so there won't be an issue. I'm just saying you don't try to do too much magic because it it, it will you will lose the, the 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 time that you spend on that. Just 
Mm, I'm not sure, man. I'll take a look, but I mean, like, the schema generated all that stuff for us. Yes, for for so retrieving the, the, to the, the end. You can see we've got list parts and auto route parts already with with the necessary parts themselves. So you you actually generated this full matrix of possibilities based on five parts. Now imagine you have fifty parts. Yeah, it will it will just work. And they are just ends. See? They are just ends, like logical end. Yeah, absolutely. But today you need memory. Okay, well, this if this is cheap and you can generate everything or the combinations, fine. But I th I'm not sure it will be. You can just create a query that does that. Okay. And when I say just create a query, for those who don't know, we can you can create other queries in Orchard Core, and then Nick's goal is to expose them each query as a GraphQL query too. And I oh think, yes, yeah. So it. the um, the nested yeah. So I'm going to use, use um, named queries for that. Exactly. Um, that's the GraphQL term. And then you will be able to map any pro parameter of the name query into a GraphQL uh, parameter yep. for the filter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the goal. Um, this is just the first step. Uh, well, actually, that's the first step. No, I like that was the first step. That no, no, but that's, that's great. That was the third step. <laughs> I'm just trying to to slow you down, not so you don't go to some places where there there is no end, and uh, so you will lose. No, well, this uh, this is actually quite nice. This works pretty well. Okay, but, um, but it doesn't work because it's in memory. Well, it does work. It just doesn't work the way you want it to work. Yeah, I mean, who will want it to work <laughs> like this? If you do that, then you'll get so many complaints. That is better than not it to needs, anything. It needs to go towards. It needs to get pushed towards the indexes. Um, uh, but a lot of this will get solved when I move. When I also implement named queries, because if there is a slow part, you know, if you then... can, if you can at least provide this kind of thing from the indices, that's already good. From one index every time. Yeah, so no, each index is I'm a name query, from. and then you could also try to mix the indices. But I will not go there because again, you have so many combinations that you will just let people create a query and expose yep. it as a GraphQL. So I... Well, named named, um, named queries look, the syntax looks different for named queries anyway. So okay. sometimes it's a little bit difficult to mix and match the two things. So um, I will try. Yeah, it, it will look good. That's great. So I love this GraphQL thing. I think it will allow so many scenarios like static code generation or just by applications and also exposing any kind of content to any app so you can have knowledge bases and 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 just query the data like this it will be great i think the um i think the deletion stuff looks like this um i wrote this yesterday i just can't remember yeah. mutation uh, delete content item and i think you just do something like content item id Bar. That's cool. And then you say at the end of it, you do um, status. And I think just OK is returned or something along those lines. Um, yeah, pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions? Who, oh. wants, who wants to use it? And Nick is working on a client API. I will. <laughs> the client API is pretty cool, um, though I haven't changed the syntax. Uh, I know that Sebastian and myself, we looked at the syntax um, after I wrote the first set of stuff on it, but I haven't changed it uh, just because at the moment it's working for what I need it for. But it will. It, the syntax will be changed. Right, so I'll send this back. How can I, how can I send control back to you, Sebastian, without Please leaving the um, meeting? You just stop presenting. Yeah, this normally boots me. No, usually not. No. Oh, okay. Still I'm still here, I see. Cool. There you go. I will not use it before it is done. You see? So finish it, stop stop working on stuff that nobody cares. GraphQL is awesome, what you've done is awesome. Just focus on raising the 
the server side support for querying data. Querying, that's the first usage that people will do with GraphQL, querying the data. Yeah, but you if, need data in the system in order to query it. And hence you, why... no, we have a UI to create data. We have recipes. I to don't data. use that UI to, to create data. I use my GraphQL to create data because it's all in my tests. Oh, yeah. But we don't run tests to create data. I do. For your tests. My tests spin up a site, create all okay. the data I need, and then run the t and run the queries against it. Antoine, why do you want to use it to be able to run tests? or to be able to get some data from an Orchard website you can edit to provide on another website? The, complete, the solution I've got is a completely headless CMS. Two, you see? Not the first one, you say two. That's, what you're doing is awesome. And you're doing also it for you. But the first usage people will do is querying the data. And they want it now. They don't want they to. They may want to query. And you can query the data, but it's not the sole need that I need it for. So yeah. I was thinking that it would be maybe a cool way to do a migration of other CMSs. Like you get the data from somewhere else and you put it into your site using this GraphQL. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that work, just create the content items and migrate the content parts across. Yeah, that could work. Well, you mean you create a custom module in the other CMSs to push the data into this thing using GraphQL? Yeah, or something that you execute in between, like as a migration tool between yeah. WordPress and Orchard, for example. So, yeah, you can also create a recipe. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so your tool could create the recipe and then you just run it. Mm-hmm. You could, you can you can use the GraphQL, but I assume it will be harder to call live APIs like this and just create a JSON document and send everything to yeah. to the recipient point because we have that already. But we actually have a so we have a client that we're we haven't started working for them yet. We're just in the sort of in the negotiation phase. But one of the things that they want us to do is to build a continuous synchronization of some of the content in a bunch of Orchard sites mm -hmm. with with another Orchard site that is kind of acting as a central repository. De deployment step. Um, in, Orchard in, Orchard, Core. in Orchard Core? Yep. OK, so you, would, you wouldn't use this for something like that? A deployment step could be, well, to, uh, today we already have some, almost something like that, not GraphQL, but uh, based on recipes. So today you can build a recipe on a deployment step, like an export, and then the, the target is another endpoint of another Orchard installation, which has a web API that receives a recipe and runs it. So today you can say extract all the content items of this type, send it to this other Orchard setup system. What you need is a step which doesn't take all the content items of a content type, but just the one since this last run or yeah yeah the ones we, the filtering you would have to do that anyway even if you use graphql or something else yes so it would be so, the same so today it's there mm -hmm. and I okay i okay. emailed it a, a year ago actually i wish i wish i'd been there <laughs> <laughs> but it's all extensible so this is a specific step that sends to an endpoint so it's configurable and the same feature provides the endpoint that you enable on the user site and then you can do staging prod or developments and yeah, you, you do whatever you want. And when we have workflow, it can be driven by workflow to have a deployment step activity that runs the deployment step. So mm -hmm. you can do anything. So yes, okay. we could have the same thing with GraphQL, like a deployment step that exports to a GraphQL thing. But today, the, the API is just the, the, of export and import is a recipe. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a, Actually, an archive which can contain which contain recipes and and binary files, so you get you get an object that you can add files to it and recipe to it, and then we send it to the other endpoint or to anything that can consume a deployment plan, and uh, and then it does what it needs to do. So yeah, usually yeah for GraphQL people use it mostly for getting data and also executing code like doing setup and stuff but that's not the obvious usage mm. 
lots of people want you know headless CMS and create a static site. I'm not sharing anything. I'd lo I'd love to use it for like building a native mobile app to just surface some content yeah. on my site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, even the, the word "some content" is very important because even if you have a big website using WorldShed, maybe you have another mobile app that wants some of this content on the mobile app. So now you can expose, just enable this GraphQL endpoint, and then from your mobile app, you can you can do that. Yeah, it will be great. Or some people want to generate static websites, so they can just build their static uh, logic and grab the content from GraphQL queries and build their static website from an Orchard uh, site using GraphQL. That's also a super um, compelling scenario for, for users. Uh, and I'm sure that's what uh, Antoine also wants. He's got two websites, one with the content and one that needs to display the content, what I just call GraphQL, dynamically or statically. Like, uh, when I say statically, generate an HTML page from GraphQL call, or every time you display the page, you call the GraphQL endpoint. And... Yeah. Hey, I, um, I had a question about something else from before. Uh, do you, is do are we planning to do shape tracing in Orchard Core? Um, there is no plan so far. Okay. So Nick has a very nice glimpse module, but the, <laughs> it used to be super nice. Um, there is a super a nice what? a glimpse module. A, gl glimpse. a glimpse. Okay. You know, like this, like Chris has done on Orchard One. Uh, mm. But the issue is that there is no active work on the Glimpse repository on .NET, so it's kind of blocked. Um, no, there is nothing like this. Okay. Um, do we need one? I always, I whenever I do theming, I find it a really, really <laughs> useful thing. I always enable it to just to to, to see the list of all the alternates that yeah. a shape. Uh, so my so I made shape tracing. I had the idea and I made it, but still, I think we need it because we don't have good docs. Yeah, maybe, but I think the list of alternates, they're kind of, I mean, they're specific to whatever plugins you might have active that might contribute to them too. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you can, code, you can code it all into static documentation, to be honest. Because it's so variable, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Com uh, com complementary, so complementary. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's okay. Right, well, we have yet another website from, uh, in Orchard Core. Antoine is the gets the all the best websites on Orchard Core. <laughs> the only websites on Orchard Core. The blog now. So did Gentilly fix uh, all your issues? This website is super fast. What are you running on? I'm sure you don't even have caching. When's the announcement going out, by the way, Sebastian? Ah, I need to. We need to push a master, and uh, some bugs are fixing the stuff that Chantier is doing for the things and the stuff I'm doing today. But yeah, the announcement is ready, and yeah. Soon, soon. And any more? Uh, are you going to go on um, the SPNet stand-up again anytime soon? Well, I haven't been invited today. <laughs> <laughs> see the footer. What should I see in the footer? What's in the footer? Powered by Orchard Core. Beautiful. And do we have... Uh, is there... Uh, I'm sure there is. Just let me check. Network. There is no Orchard or is the generator here? Oh, just Orchard. Yeah, we should maybe change that. We talk about it, yeah, Orchard Core, something like that. And are we going to merge in the Bootstrap Beta 2 stuff? How close, uh, how far away are we in, from doing in, that? In Beta 2. The PR is ready, but uh, Beta 2. 
Okay. I'm too scared of the changes. So are we literally just on bug fixing for beta one? Yep. Okay. Uh, I there is a, a module in the repo called orchardcore.demo. What does that one do? Just uh, sandbox. It's not even referenced by the CMS project. It's just a bunch of tests and samples we provide. So for instance, um, there is an endpoint using the OpenID module to show how you can use it. And yeah, it's it's like experimental in Orchard 1. The first module ever created, I believe. Yes, because we had to start somewhere. So yeah, hmm. it has controllers, razor pages, it's a bunch of things that yeah, and like there is a page to test performance for all the kind of shapes, creations you could create to compare it to view components, um, yeah, different drivers, all the things you can imagine whenever we create a new feature and want to test it, we use the demo thing. But we don't okay. reference it. Reference it. Mm. And and I think, oh, wait, maybe we have, I'm sh I think we shipped it on NuGet, which is bad, but uh, I should <laughs> extract it. But so you, you basically, it's a test test harness. Yeah. Module kind of thing. Okay. And also, when you want to show a sample of something, you do not have doc. We, you just create that, and yeah, one day I'm sure we'll delete it when we have good documentation and we trust. It's got a lot of crazy stuff in there. Yeah. Stuff also that doesn't work, like IDs or yeah. All right. What cool. is that? Orchard core issues, a new issue. Documentation as a feature. Why are you pointing it to that? We should close it. Oh, you made a new thing? No. Um, yeah, that's it. So you all saw the video last week on LiveSP.net? Yep. Nick and Daniel, Good. I know, saw that. Sipka tweeted about it, so I should watch it. Yeah, that was nice. Good job on that. Yep. Lots of good feedback and new users since then, so that's good. And also people who want to migrate their multi-tenancy or uh, SaaS frameworks to uh, using Orchard CMS framework, sorry, Orchard framework directly. So that's good. Um, yep, I liked it. Nice. Okay. Is Hanselman gonna migrate his blog across anytime oh, soon or? Never. Why would he? It works. Only Antoine migrates to Ultra Core. Hey, by the way, look at that. You got the bootstrap icon, Antoine. The five icon. It's fast. It's too fast. Well, you don't have the auto routes, or maybe it's your import, which is not correct. And I even have a discuss comment module. Oh yes, you see how you that. Uh, look, uh, of the first, uh, the first one. Uh, Did you see that your auto routes are wrong? Oh yeah. They just uh, the, the last bug is good, but the other ones are not good. It's because uh, uh, the name of uh, a property changed from a slug to path in auto okay. route. Okay, so you need to fix your export. Uh, and you say you have a discuss module. Good. Did you publish it? No, not yet. Did we? Talk about it together uh, last week uh, on the yeah, Thursday. Yeah, just be sure that it was you and not someone else who is also doing the same thing. Okay. Oh, well, on, okay, okay, okay. Yes, on the trash. Good. It's perfect. And tags which are fake tags, I assume, because we don't have tagging. That the next module on my list, taxonomy, which will be also tagging. Is it a bug here? It's beautiful. Yeah, that's we could enable search uh, easily ah. and index uh, tags, uh, the tags uh, field. Query. Oh, you could do a custom query, actually. Mm. Yes, I would like to do the archives uh, widget. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't have my code sample. Yes. That's what you will say. Okay. I have a code sample for archive widget. I will I will give it to you. And you can make a blog post. <laughs> okay, great. Good. Done. It's time. Perfect. Thanks everyone. And uh, let's all send personal emails to Nick so he can focus on the querying part of GraphQL and not the setup action. 
Don't worry about <laughs> client. We still love you, Nick. We want you to finish it because we want to use it. I work on it part time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Sip next week, workflows? Yeah, who knows? Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> well, if you don't know, I'm telling you, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, everyone. See you. Cheers, guys. Next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.